Welcome to the Crit IQ podcast on assessing fluid responsiveness. Optimizing fluid management for a severely ill patient is an integral part of the day for a critical care physician. This podcast will cover the following points. Definition of fluid responsiveness and a reminder of the physiology behind the process. An explanation of the clinical significance in critical illness. An outline of the potential methods used to determine fluid responsiveness. An introduction to some relevant papers in this field. Specifically, this podcast does not deal with what type of fluid or how much should be given to a critically ill patient. These topics are covered in other podcasts in the fluid module. The definition of fluid responsiveness varies depending on a clinical or research setting. Clinically, it is the physiological ability of the patient to increase stroke volume in response to a bolus of intravenous fluid. In other words, it is a measure of the patient's response to a change in preload. One research definition is an increase in baseline stroke volume by 10 to 15% after a 500 ml crystalloid fluid bolus. As we know, cardiac output is the product of stroke volume and heart rate. Stroke volume is dependent upon preload, afterload and contractility. The Frank Starling law explains the correlation between preload and stroke volume and hence cardiac output. This graph shows how an increase in end diastolic volume results in an increase in stroke volume. However, this is only true to a point. At a threshold end diastolic volume, an increase will cause a drop in stroke volume as the cardiac myofibrils become overstretched. Patients on the rise of the curve are underfilled and should respond with a disproportionately large increase in stroke volume following a small increase in end diastolic volume by way of a fluid bolus. However, patients who are overfilled or even euvolemic will experience very little change in stroke volume when given a fluid challenge. In fact, patients who do not have recruitable cardiac output will suffer potential harm with further inappropriate fluid administration, causing tissue edema and dysoxia. So how do we determine where any individual patient's preload status may lie? Well, that is the challenge of clinical measures of fluid responsiveness. Furthermore, the measures we use to estimate fluid status are based on our current understanding of fluid physiology. Specifically, if compliance of the left ventricle remains static, the left ventricular end diastolic volume is proportional to the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. This is the basis of using right and left pressures as measures of ventricular preload. So measuring the end diastolic pressure in the right atrium, or CVP, may guide the assessment of preload. With the application of Starling's law, we have to unfortunately make several assumptions. Venous return and preload are the primary determinants of cardiac output. The primary determinant of left ventricular end diastolic volume is preload. This is likely as fluid resuscitation is the primary modality of resuscitation and hypotension associated with a distributive shock state. We assume that increasing cardiac output improves tissue perfusion. And this is not always true. We assume improvement in macrovascular markers such as mean arterial pressure and rate, implies improvement in tissue flow. We assume that improving tissue perfusion improves outcomes. We currently have very poor measures of tissue perfusion, such as lactate and capillary refill time, although there may be some newer tools, such as capilloscopy. We assume that fluids are the best and only way to increase preload, although venoconstriction may achieve this too. We assume that the benefits described above outweigh the harms of fluids, not only in the range of fluid unresponsiveness, but in the range of fluid responsiveness too. Methods used to determine fluid responsiveness. This is performed by the critical care physician at any time it is felt that the patient requires optimization of their hemodynamic status. An example of clinical measures used as indicators of fluid responsiveness are the recent 2012 surviving sepsis guidelines. The recommendations during initial resuscitation include aiming for a CVP of 8 to 12 centimeters of water, arterial pressure of above 65 millimeters of mercury, a urine output of greater than half a mil per kilogram per hour, SVC sats of 70% or mixed venous sats of greater than 65%, and to target a normal lactate level. These parameters really stem from the early goal-directed therapy for sepsis discussed in a landmark trial by Rivers in 2001. If these parameters are not met, the guidelines suggest a fluid bolus of up to 30 mL per kilo of crystalloid. So let's review these and other measures of fluid status. There are some traditional clinical measures of fluid status. These include capillary refill time and daily weight. However, these are not predictors of fluid responsiveness, and as such, other measures have been developed.
Intravas intravascular pressure can be divided into static and dynamic measures. Static measures include JVP, CVP, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. As it turns out, CVP and PAOP are at best a guide to preload and health only. Multiple studies demonstrate that they do not reflect fluid responsiveness in the critically ill patient. While this is an area of current contention, a very recent and repeated meta-analysis by Merrick demonstrates that CVP should not be used as a guide to fluid therapy. No, however, there, are, there may still be other reasons to transduce CVP. For example, just to confirm line position, to assess for TR, tamponade or constrictive pericarditis. The pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is normally 6 to 15 millimeters of mercury is measured in end diastole and end expiration. As another static measurement, it tends to correlate poorly to fluid responsiveness. Hemodynamic markers that may help in predicting fluid responsiveness include systolic pressure variation or stroke volume variation, which may be obtained with arterial pulse waveform analysis devices such as the Vigileo and Pico, esophageal Doppler, and assessment of IVC caliber on ultrasound. Systolic pressure variation. In a normal patient who is breathing spontaneously, blood pressure decreases on inspiration and increases on expiration. An exaggeration of this is known as paradoxus. The reverse of this occurs in positive pressure mechanical ventilation. The range of normal peak decrease in systolic pressure has been reported between 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Current suggestion is that an SPV of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury is sensitive to reductions in LV preload. Stroke volume variation, or SV max minus SV min divided by SV mean. This is similar to the above in that significant variation of respiration suggests that the patient is operating on the upslope of the Starling curve. A variation of greater than 10% suggests that the patient responds positively to fluids. In the absence of limitations, Stroke volume variation is a good predictor of fluid responsiveness. The limitations of using stroke volume variation includes that for now this measure has not been validated in spontaneous breathing, small tidal volumes, and by that we mean less than 8 mils per kilogram, or arrhythmia or open chest patients. Esophageal Doppler. This tool can be used in several ways. FTC, or flow time corrected, one can measure preload, and this has been shown to be more reliable on trend analysis than pulmonary artery occlusion pressure alone, for instance. Stroke volume can also be measured, and is, in a recent study in January of this 2013, was found to be superior to flow time correction. Peak velocity, cardiac output, and stroke volume can also be measured using esophageal Doppler. Echocardiography. Again, there are new, numerous variables obtained from ECHO, but one relatively simple bedside test is the IVC caliber. IVC caliber is affected by respiratory state. With the IVC collapsing during mechanical expir expiration and distending with inspiration, this is exacerbated by relative hypovolemia. The greater the collapse during expiration, the greater the degree of fluid depletion. As a result, a distensibility index of IVC can be used to measure fluid responsiveness. It's given by the formula with the threshold value of approximately 18%, where the IVC cover is equal to Dmax minus Dmin divided by Dmin. There are several issues with measuring IVC. Firstly, that of operator error. Secondly, the IVC diameter and collapsibility is affected by far more than just the volume status, specifically intrathoracic pressure including high peak levels. One obvious way to assess for fluid responsiveness is to assess your patient before and after a 500 ml fluid bolus. A measurable difference in clinical state may be interpreted as fluid responsive. Two difficulties arise here. The first is that a positive response does not necessarily mean that further fluid is required if the patient has approached the peak of the Starling curve. However, it is likely that if, that if there is minimal improvement, further fluids are unlikely to be of benefit. The second problem is that the only way that this test can be analysed is to give the fluid. As discussed, fluids do have side effects of their own, and it would be helpful if this could be performed without giving fluids. A passive leg raise is a reversible manoeuvre that mimics an acute volume expansion.
To truly assess the effect of passive leg raise, an accurate measure of stroke volume, as discussed above, is required. Laboratory research has shown that a passive leg raise resulting in an increased descending aortic blood flow of greater than 10% is predictive of fluid responsiveness. A passive leg raise requires the patient to start in a semi-recumbent position at 45 degrees head up, to then lie supine and have legs passively raised 45 degrees, as per the image on this slide. This is equivalent to volume expansion of 500 to 750 mil. Passive leg raise was recently validated in spontaneously breathing patients in sepsis or acute pancreatitis. There is a wealth of medical literature that deals with fluid composition and cardiac output monitoring devices. However, there is relative paucity of literature concerning the dose of fluid and the measure of fluid responsiveness. A starting point includes studies that promote some of the above measures of fluid responsiveness and arguably still promote some now outdated static measurements. They include the 2001 Rivers Early Goal Directed Therapy, the 2012 Surviving Sepsis Campaign, and the 2013 Merrick Meta-Analysis. The references for these resources are given on this slide. In summary, fluid responsiveness is poorly assessed using clinical measures and speculative administration of fluids may harm instead of benefit the patient. Fluid responsiveness is best assessed using a passive leg raise or dynamic intravascular pressure analysis. Ultrasound may be useful for the skilled operator. Traditional static pressure measurements such as CVP and pulmonary capillary ridge pressure appear to be poor predictors for fluid responsiveness. The ability to assess fluid responsiveness will allow one to predict the clinical response to a fluid bolus and so may directly affect patient management. This Crit IQ vodcast has been produced with support from our sponsor CSL. CSL has had no editorial influence in the making of this podcast.